Now there is a part of life which is how do you scramble out of your mistakes without them costing too much? And we've done some of that too. And if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, think of its founding businesses, a doomed department store, a doomed New England textile company, and a doomed trading stamp company. Out of that came Berkshire Hathaway. Now, we handled those losing hands pretty well and we bought into them very cheaply. But of course, the success came from changing our ways and getting into the better businesses. And it isn't that we were so good at doing things that were difficult. We were good at avoiding things that were difficult. Finding things that are easy. The business of, of controlling the costs and living simply. And that was the secret. How much money? Warren and I had tiny little bits of money. We always underspent our incomes and we invested and we, well, you know, if you live long enough, you end up rich. It's not very complicated. Warren and I have not made our way in life by making successful macroeconomic predictions sure. and betting on our conclusions. Our system is to swim as competently as we can, and sometimes the tide will be with us and sometimes it will be against us. But by and large, we don't much bother with trying to predict the tides because we plan to play for the game for a long time. I recommend to all of you exactly the same attitude. It's kind of a snare and a delusion to outguess macroeconomic cycles. Very few people do it successfully and some of them do it by accident. I don't think it's wise to have an ambition to be president of the United States or a billionaire or something like that because the odds are too much against you. Much better to aim low. I did not intend to get rich. I wanted to get independent. I just overshot. And <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, while you're clapping, some of the overshooting was accidental. There's some there's a there's a big, you can be very deserving and very intelligent and very disciplined, but there's also a factor of luck that comes into this thing. And the people who get the, good, the outcomes that seem extraordinary, they're the people who have discipline and intelligence and good virtue, plus a hell of a lot of luck. Why wouldn't the world work like that? So you shouldn't give credit for the unusual. Uh, a lot of the people a friend of mine said about a colleague of his in his fraternity, he says, old George was a duck sitting on a pond and they raised the level of the pond. There are a lot of people that just luck into the right place and rise and then, and there are a lot of very eminent people who have many advantages and they've got one little flaw or one bit of bad luck and they, they're mired in misery all their lives. And I will say something about life generally. I was very lucky and I had an ancestor that I never met. My mother's grandfather was a pioneer. He came out to Iowa and he lived in a sod house with his young wife. That's a cave through two winters. And he, he literally was a pioneer from nothing. And he rose finally to where he controlled the leading bank in the town and, and was a very reputable citizen and a very charitable man. He joined Andrew Carnegie and gave the town library to Algona. My grandfather made him do it, my grand great-grandmother. He never would have done it by himself. <laughs> and he made him put his giant tarpon in the library as part of the gift. He, so, <laughs> always amused me to go by that library and see this giant tarpon. So the eccentrics come naturally in my family. But at any rate, <laughs> Having wrested the success from hardship and danger and trouble, and he was a captain in the Black Hawk Wars, I mean, he was literally a soldier and part of this. He had this theory looking back at his long life with this unusual success. And he owned a bunch of farms at the end that he leased to Germans. But you couldn't lose money leasing a farm to a German in Iowa. Naturally, he was successful. And, and, but what he said over and over again to his grandchildren, including my mother, 
us the real opportunities that come to you are few it's a very fortunate life that is just bathed in opportunity all the way most people just get a few times when they can make a huge difference by seizing a huge activity and he said when you find one my dear grandchildren and you can clearly recognize it he says seize it boldly and don't do it small and my mother who wasn't interested in finance but liked to talk the family she liked to transmit the family quirks but of course this guy was my soulmate the great grandfather I never knew and of course I totally adopted his point of view and I must say it has worked wonderfully much of what is taught in modern corporate finance courses is twaddle Do you want to elaborate on that, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot believe this stuff. I mean, <laughs> it, it's uh, modern portfolio theory, and uh, yeah, it's it's it has no utility. But I mean, it, it, it you know it will tell you how to do average, but you know I I I, I think uh, anybody can figure out how to do average in fifth grade. I mean, it, it's just not that difficult, and uh, it's it's elaborate and you know there's lots of little greek letters and all kinds of things to make you feel that you're in the big leagues but it uh, there is no value added <laughs> i have great difficulty with it because i am something of a student of dementia and i have <laughs> yeah, we hang around a lot together and i can ordinarily <laughs> classify dementia you know on some uh, theory structure of models but the modern portfolio theory uh, it involves a type of dementia I just can't even classify. The great secret is that we're good at lifelong learning. Warren is so much better in some ways in his 70s and 80s than he was younger that it's almost awesome. But if you keep learning all the time, you have a huge advantage. And, and we, we both just like it. And we have a wonderful group of friends. Really wonderful. From whom we can learn a lot. One of these guys at the Berkshire meeting from one of the foreign publications said, why do a couple of guys in a little place in Omaha do so much better than all these powerful minds and great institutions? And I said, well, I think Warren and I know the edge of our competency better than other people do. And that's humility in the umbrella sense. And that is a very important thing to know. I say over and over again, it's not a competency if you don't know the edge of it. You are a disaster if you don't know the edge of your own competency. Warren frequently says, I'd rather deal with a guy with an IQ of 130 who thinks it's 125 than a guy with an IQ of 180 that thinks it's 200. That, that second guy will kill you. And, and so it is very important to know the edge of your own competency. Well, luckily, I got at a very early age the idea that the safest way to try and get what you want is to try and deserve what you want. It's such a simple idea. It's the golden rule, so to speak. You, you want to deliver to the world what you would buy if you were on the other end. There is no ethos, in my opinion, that is better for any lawyer or any other person to have. By and large, the people who've had this ethos uh, win in life, and they don't win just money, just honors and emoluments. They win the respect, the deserved trust of the people they deal with. And there is huge pleasure in life to be obtained from getting deserved trust. And so, and the way to get it is to deliver what you'd want to buy if the circumstances were reversed. It's not my nature when you get little surprises as a result of human nature to spend much time feeling b betrayed. I am always want to just put my head down and adjust so I don't allow myself to spend much time ever with any feelings of betrayal. So you're asking the wrong person because if I if some flickering idea like that came to me, I'd get rid of it quickly. 
I don't like any feeling of being victimized. I think that's a counterproductive way to think as a human being. And I am not a victim. How did, did I'm it, a survivor.